What the strengths program is designed to do when you really boil it down to size is this. How can you take people who are using their strengths about once a week, which 73% of us do, and get us to use our strengths most of the time, which less than 12% of us do? You know, you read the business press and you're led to believe that there are such things as great companies and they're not so great companies. But if you look closer, you realize that that's a fiction. There are no such things as great companies. There are great teams and not so great teams. And if you work for a not so great team in a supposedly great company, it feels not so great. The experience of the team trumps the experience of the company. When we go into a company, we study their best teams in the hopes of finding out what they have in common, in the hopes of perhaps building more teams like their best teams. And when you do that, when you go into a company and study the best teams, you make one discovery. And you make this discovery every time you do it. You find out that there is huge range in performance, team by team by team, within the same company. Let me give you a couple of examples. This first one is a large retailer. And the whole premise of this retailer is that the more affluent the community where we site the store, the more money that store should make. And if you plot out all the stores, all 3,000 of the stores within this company on those two variables, profitability and local economic potential, you see a beautiful red line going from bottom left to top right, which proves the point. The more affluent the community, the more money the particular store makes. So far, so good. But, but if you actually plot out the stores themselves, on those two variables, you see a graph like this. You see huge range. You'll see, a, you'll see a blue dot way down there at the bottom that's making a lot less money than you would have predicted, given the amount of money available in the community. And then if you go, if you just go in a vertical line straight up, you'll see that there's a store way up there at the top that's making a lot more money than you'd have expected given the amount of money available. Now, now, every single one of those blue dots are stores. They've got about 100 people working in those stores and they've got a whole bunch of customers coming into those stores. Well, well this isn't one company, is it? It's either the, the store at the bottom there or the store way up there at the top. And those two stores don't feel the same. They don't feel the same to customers and they don't feel the same to employees. What goes on in that store at the top? What is different about that store that is so completely outperforming the rest? And when you look inside a company, you don't just see differences in terms of profitability or performance team by team by team. You see differences in all kinds of outcomes. Here's an example looking at employee turnover. This happens to be a large automobile company and this is their dealership network. I'm going to show you the top 10% of dealers as compared to the bottom 10% of dealers on number of people who quit last year. Not that were fired, they just left. Now the, the promise this company makes to you is not just that they make great cars, although they do make great cars, is that the quality of the sales and service people in the dealership are going to be so fantastic that when you experience it, you won't even consider going anywhere else to buy or service your car. All right, so here's the top 10% compared to the bottom 10% of dealers on number of people who left last year. Well here, as you can see, the top 10% lost in total last year 42 people, which works out to be about 8% turnover, which isn't bad. The bottom 10% lost 847 people last year. Now remember, this is the same company. These people are doing the same job. They're paid in the same way, same training. They're selling the same car to the same kinds of people in the same kinds of towns. And yet some of those teams can keep their people while others seem to be bleeding their talent profusely. Why? What's the difference between the great teams and the not so great teams inside a company? We found that there is one question one question which predicts most effectively, most consistently, whether you'll be on a high performance team or a low performance team. At work, do you have an opportunity to do what you do best every day? At work, do you have an opportunity to use your strengths every day? Those teams where people say that they do, massively and consistently outperform those teams where people say that they don't. 
Even if people are slightly positively deluded about what their strengths are, it doesn't seem to matter. If you feel as though your strengths are being used more often, more frequently, more consistently, you'll be more profitable, more productive, you're more likely to stick around, you're less likely to have accidents on the job, you're less likely to sue if you do have accidents on the job, you're less likely to steal. Almost any outcome you care to think of seems to be driven by whether you, the employee, feel as though your strengths are in play. About seven or eight years ago, I wrote a book called Now Discover Your Strengths. And in that book, there was a poll where a very simple question was asked. The question was this, which do you think will help you be most successful in life? Building on your strengths or fixing your weaknesses? Which do you think? In the US, turns out the US is actually the most strengths focused nation in the world. 41% of people back in the year 2000, 41% of people would bet their career, their success, their satisfaction, their contribution on leveraging their strengths. 59% of people said they would fix their weaknesses. In Britain, 38% of people would bet their life on their strengths. Canada, 38%, all the way down to Japan and China. Japan and China, 24% of people in those countries would bet their career, their performance on leveraging their strengths. Now, a lot's happened between now and 2000. You've seen changes in the way we start to think about who we are and what contribution we make. The whole of psychology has shifted its focus. But weirdly enough today, if you repeat that poll and you ask that question again, which do you think will help you be most successful? Building on strengths or fixing weaknesses? When you ask that question again today, here's what you get. 41% of people say strengths and 59% of people say weaknesses. It hasn't budged at all. We live in a remedial world. We live in a world where in general, people are fascinated by weaknesses and they tend to take their strengths for granted. And you can see it everywhere. We seem to think that good is just the opposite of bad. If you want good, study bad and invert it. We're wrong. If you study bad and invert it, you get not bad. And that's just different than, than good or great. The whole point of this strengths movement is the idea that if you want to become your most productive, your most effective at work, as an individual, as a team member, as a company, you've got to study your strengths and you've got to figure out a way to deploy those strengths. And I tell you what, if you wanted to figure out whether or not you were building a strengths-based life or a strengths-based team or a strengths-based company, you wouldn't just ask what people believe, would you? You'd ask what people talk about. So here's a question that we ask to figure out what people talk about. The question was this, when you talk to your manager about your performance, what do you spend most time talking about? And we gave three choices. Uh, we talk about my strengths, we talk about my weaknesses, or we don't talk about that stuff at all. And here's the data. As you can see, most people are either talking about their weaknesses or they're not talking about strengths or weaknesses at all. Less than a quarter of people are even talking about their strengths. One final question. I mean, if you really wanted to know if you were building a strengths-based life or a strengths-based team, you wouldn't just ask about conversations. And you wouldn't ask what people believe. You'd ask what people do, wouldn't you? You'd ask what people do. Well, here's a question which asks what people do, a simple question. What percentage of a typical day do you spend playing to your strengths? In 2005, 17% of people say, I use my strengths most of the time at work. In 2006, it was 14% of people say most of the time. In 2007, it was 12% of people say I use my strengths most of the time. We know from the research that the single most important driver of performance on a team is whether or not a person feels that their strengths are in play. And yet, and yet barely one out of 10 people feel as though their strengths are in play. It's the single most important driver of performance and we're rotten at it. So, how do you get more than 12% of people to say they play to their strengths at work? How do you do that? Well, I would suggest there's two ways. One is you can fix all your people systems. You can dive into your people systems, your, your selection systems, your compensation systems, your performance management systems, your succession planning systems. You can look at those and say, are they remedial based on weakness and deficit thinking, or are they strengths-based? And you can try them, redesign them so they become strengths-based. You can fix the systems. But we think that the most sensible place to start isn't with the systems, it's with the self. After all, as the airlines are fond of saying, 
put your own oxygen mask on first before you charge around trying to help everybody else. So one way to begin with this is to think about, are you one of the 12%? Are you one of the very few people that have somehow figured out how to identify your strengths and put them to work? Now, often when you bring up this whole idea of identifying and using your strengths to drive performance, people will say, hey, look, I can't find the perfect job. I can't, I can't come into a company and just do that because the company's got all kinds of demands and expectations on me. I can't craft my job to fit my strengths. I've, I've got to just do what people ask me to do. I've got to hold out somehow for that perfect job and that perfect job isn't the one I'm in. All right, well, I hear that a lot. I'm sure you hear that a lot. But actually, you look at the data, the data doesn't bear that out. In fact, if you ask people, what is your ideal job? They don't say some special far away job where they're telecommuting from their cabin in the hills of Oregon. They don't say that. They say either what I'm doing now with increased responsibility or a specialized subset of what I'm doing now. If you ask people, why did you take your current job? And you give them a long list of possible answers. By far the most common answer is I took this job because it was a great opportunity to do more of what I really like to do. If you ask people, how often do you feel an emotional high from your job? Most people say that happens at least once a week. Or if you ask people, how often do you get so focused on what you're doing you lose track of time and forget your troubles, which is a pretty good clue that your strengths are being used. 73% of people say that happens at least once a week. 73% of people say, I get so focused I lose track of time at least once a week. How do you go from using your strengths once a week to most of the time? How do you take a responsible stand for your strengths, figure out what they are, gradually push your time toward them, and talk with others about what you're doing persuasively enough so everyone is thinking about how can you make your greatest and longest lasting contribution to this company? Remember, the whole point of building on your strengths isn't necessarily to make you happier, although it might. The point of it, as the data shows, is to drive performance. The best companies aren't great companies. They are simply an accumulation of fantastically great teams. And great teams are built upon individuals who take their strengths seriously and figure out how to put them to work.